persecution, there's pain, suffering, but you can get on this jumbo jet. Stand in line, stand in line. Don't get tired of standing in line. Some people will be playing. Some people will be having fun, and they'll make fun of you because you're standing in line. Don't get tired of standing in line. Wait for me. Be willing to wait.
Today we ask, Holy Spirit, Spirit of truth, reveal the truth of eternity for us today. Lord, reveal the bigger picture to us today. Lord, to our children, to our grandchildren, Lord, to people in our community. Lord, that there is a blessed hope beyond this life. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for that. And Lord, again, as you, as you have shared through your spirit to us just a few moments ago, Lord, that that eternity is not just for us. We have opportunity and responsibility to let other people know that there is an eternity, that there is something after this life. Now, church, can you just take a moment? I want you to begin to pray for those individuals, those names that come to mind. Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a co-worker. Of just individuals that say, you know what? I, I just, they, they need to, to, to get a glimpse of, of who God is. Maybe they've, they've not even heard the name of Jesus. They don't know what's available. But can we just intercede on their behalf for a moment? Let's just lift up names of individuals right now. God, we come before you for those that do not know you. Lord, we come before you on behalf of those that maybe did know you at one time but have turned their backs. Lord, we pray that great revelation would take place. And Lord, again, that they would see you in all of your grace, in all of your mercy. Lord, as we heard last Sunday, Lord, Jesus is not looking down on them. It's really that God is, not just today, but God has really burdened your heart for some individual or individual. I just encourage you just to lift your hands up and just say, God, I just surrender them to you. Maybe it's a son, maybe it's a daughter, maybe it's a co-worker family member. Can we just lift up our hands to God and just surrender them to them today? We are trusting that you're going to reveal yourself to them. It's your desire that none should perish. So Lord God, we speak salvation right now. We release salvation right now. We declare salvation right now. specifically to some of you today. Just encourage you to respond to the Holy Spirit. Some of you came in with very, very heavy heart. And I encourage you and challenge you today to lift up your eyes to the hills from whence come with our help. Our help comes from the Lord. Our help comes from the Lord. Our help comes from the Lord.
Jesus is greater. Lord, today we make the declaration, Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. And we thank you for the privilege and opportunity that we have to discover even more today of his greatness, of his power. So God, we ask that you would open our eyes to see what we've not seen before. Open our ears to hear what we've not heard before. Open our hearts to feel and experience what we've not felt before. So that for your honor and glory, we can do what we have never done before. While this time is yours, we commit it to you. And we thank you for this time now. And we pray these things in the precious, powerful name of Jesus. Amen. 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 You may be seated. You've got some busy bags for the kids that uh, will be distributing those. So kids, you can raise your hands. And uh, parents, you can get that information. Just a couple of things as we uh, are doing that. For those of you that are online, uh, we made announcements earlier. Next Sunday, we're going to be doing church outside. Encourage you. We're going to be out on the, on the lawn out here, and so I encourage you to join us if at all possible next Sunday. More details will be on our Facebook page. Uh, for those of you that have been uh, uh, giving online, thank you so much for that. In the bulletin, there's a couple of options for giving online. We have the, the boxes in the back as well. Uh, we have talked, that was a couple weeks ago, talked about that God deserves our best, God deserves the first, and many of you have responded to that. Thank you so much for that. And all of us can grow in that area of giving. Maybe it's uh, from giving nothing to something, or from giving something to giving systematic, or from giving systematic to tithing, or from tithing to giving sacrificial. And uh, so I just encourage you to, uh, to check that out as well. But we're glad that all of you are here this morning. Let's uh, let's take a moment and uh, take your Bibles or whatever. Pastor Vondell is going to be sharing the word this morning. Uh, so let's just uh, prepare our hearts for all that God has for us. Good morning. Welcome to church. Um, we are continuing our series, Jesus is Greater, and uh, we are trying to kind of uh, systematically move through the book of Hebrews, and today we're in chapter 9, so if you have your Bibles, you can go to, to Hebrews chapter 9, and uh, I'm not going to read the entire chapter this morning because I have several other passages of scripture that I'm going to be referencing this morning, so, um, but we are going to be reading some very specific verses from chapter 9. I know we've been doing a lot of praying, but I'm going to pray one more prayer here before we launch in. And we just join me in this particular prayer. Holy Spirit, we just ask that this morning you would give a greater revelation of, of who Jesus is. If we've never seeing who Jesus truly is, let us see it this morning. If we've lost sight, let us see Jesus again. We just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal Jesus like only you can. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So, the title this morning, um, again, this is coming from chapter 9, is Jesus is greater than all types, all copies, all symbols, and all shadows. I know that's kind of a big title, but I think you'll understand in a bit. Jesus is greater than all types, copies, symbols, and shadows. God gave his people types and copies, symbols, shadows, to help them better understand his plan of salvation. In the pages of scripture, God will often give us things or people that represent something or, or someone else. So scripture gives us uh, all these different types, copies, symbols, shadows. But the reality is, is that Jesus is greater than all of them. And here's just a couple examples of these, these copies, these these types, these shadows that we see in Scripture. Uh, so, Caleb, if you want to throw that next one up on the slide, we'll get a visual of this. I don't know if you can see those. Romans 5.14 is an example of this. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. You know, Adam being the first guy who walked the earth that God created, Adam being the first one is like a type of Jesus, the first one who 
comes as the only begotten of the Father, the one that, that lives a perfect life, the first one who rises from the dead to, to never die again. Adam is a, is a type of Jesus. Okay, Colossians 2, 16 through 17. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Several weeks ago, we talked about how Jesus is greater than your striving. And even the Sabbath, even the Sabbath points to Jesus. It's a shadow, a mere shadow of the substance belonging to Christ. So, Hebrews chapter 9 begins with a review of the first covenant system that God put in place. God provided the tabernacle, the ministry of the Levitical priesthood, and the system of offering the blood of animals as a sacrifice in order that his people could begin to see the, the type, the copy, the symbol, the shadow of his plan of salvation. The commandments were given, and as you know, in the pages of scripture, we as human beings did not do good with keeping the commandments. We failed miserably. And so a system was put in place where there could be forgiveness of sin. The tabernacle really pointed directly to the sacrifice and the salvation that only Jesus could provide. So in Hebrews 9, we're going to read verse 2. Verse 2. And Caleb, if you want to throw that up, there's kind of a visual of, of what we're going to be reading here. Hebrews 9, verse 2. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. Now let's just pause for just a moment and just look at a few things that are mentioned there. Can we see Jesus in the types or symbols that are found in the tabernacle? A lampstand. Now just think of some things that Jesus said himself. Okay, how could a lampstand reference Jesus? Well, Jesus said in John 8, 12, he said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Sacred bread. Well, think of what Jesus said in John 6, 51. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And then the, the tabernacle contained this veil that closed off the, 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 probably the most sacred part of the temple. It was where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. It was called the Holy of Holies. It was the place where the presence of God would be found. And yet this too was a type, a copy, a symbol, a shadow that ultimately pointed to Jesus. Remember, Jesus is Emmanuel. What does that name mean? God with us. God with us. And Jesus, God with us, came and tabernacled among us. John 14, 1 says this, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And really the... The Hebrew word, or the Greek word used for dwelt there is tabernacled. And dwelt among us, or tabernacled among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The tabernacle system with its structure, the ministry that the priests carried out, and the sacrifices that were offered all pointed to Jesus. They were types, they were copies, they were symbols, they were shadows. The writer of Hebrews makes the case that these could never, in and of themselves, make one right with God. Let's go to verse 9 of chapter 9, Hebrews 9, 9. Which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifice are offered 
which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. So even with this beautiful temple set up, all the sacrifices, all the thing that's going on, it could not completely take away sin and really relieve the conscience of, of sin. And so the good news is, in steps Jesus. And now we'll look at verses 11 through 14 of chapter 9. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Jesus is the greater and more perfect one. Verse 11. More, greater and more perfect than the former tabernacle, than the, the priesthood of the Levites, than the, the blood sacrifices. He is the one that is without blemish. He is the perfect Lamb of God. I came across a couple statements that uh, William McDonald makes in his, uh, his commentary, the Believer's Bible Commentary. And I thought it, it, it says it just really, really well. So we'll try to put those on the screen, see if you can read along with those. The, the first statement, the tabernacle system was symbolic for the present time, a picture of something better to come. It was an imperfect representation of Christ's perfect work. And then the second statement. Finally, the sacrifices were temporary. They were imposed until the time of reformation. They pointed forward to the coming of Christ and to his perfect offering. The perfection of Jesus and his perfect sacrifice are without compare. So, at this point, what, what I'm hoping that you begin to see, according to Hebrews chapter 9, is that Jesus is greater. He's greater than the tabernacle. He's greater than the sacrifices. He's greater than the work that the priest could, could carry off. Jesus is the only one who is perfect. And, and I, I love, I'm going to read to you a passage that... that to me, it just is so powerful when we talk about the perfection and the beauty of Christ. Jesus is like nobody else. Let me read to you from the last book of the Bible, Hebrews chapter 5. And we're going to go to heaven for this scene. And you're going to see a, a scene around the throne room. And it goes like this. This is in Hebrews 5. I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. I saw in the right hand... Of him who sat on the throne, a book, or some versions will say a scroll, written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said, stop weeping. Behold, the line that is of from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw before the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb. Standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, 
The four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Did you catch what, what was going on there? This search is going out in all of heaven, in all of earth. Who is able to take the scroll? And there's only one that is found worthy. There's only one who fits the category of Jesus. There's only one that is perfect. A perfect sacrifice in the perfect timing. It was perfectly finished. Let's go back to Hebrews 9. Let's read verses 24 through 26. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own, Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Recently, in these last couple weeks, I, I feel like the Lord has been really getting my attention on some things. And... The Lord has been showing me that there's, there's some things that are not quite right in my life. I think I've lost sight of, of who Jesus is and his greatness and his perfection and his beauty. Now, how do I determine that I've lost sight of Jesus? Well, I'm, I've been noticing that I don't talk about him a whole lot. And... Jesus said in Luke 6, 45, that the mouth speaks of what the heart is full of. And yes, when I would get up to preach, I would talk about Jesus. Yes, on Wednesday nights, when I, our middle schoolers, I would talk about Jesus. Yes, on Sunday nights, when some high schoolers would come over, I would talk about Jesus. Yes, at the altar, when I would pray for somebody, yes, I would talk about Jesus. But then... That was about it. That was about it. So the rest of the time, I was talking about camping and biking and hiking and jogging and bow hunting and family and vacation days and fishing and swimming and the coronavirus and the Republicans and the Democrats and the election and money and fire pits and mowing and TV shows and food and the list goes on and on and on. Those are some of the things that I talk about. I think there were many days that in everyday conversation, I wasn't talking about Jesus at all. Like a whole day would go by and I didn't really talk about Jesus. Now, is that a requirement that we go around talking about Jesus constantly? I don't think so. But I do think that the words that come out of our mouth are an indication of some things that are going on or not going on. Last fall, after shooting two deer with my bow, and yes, it was legal because I shot my one with the, the, the rifle tag with my bow too. After I shot those two deer with my bow, I found that I was talking to people, uh, all kinds of people about bow hunting. I do enjoy life, and I do enjoy the blessings that God has given us. But... The, re the realization here is I've gotten really focused on the types, the copies, the symbols, the shadows instead of the real thing. How is it possible that we so easily forget the one who is perfect, the one who saved us, the one who is so powerful 
that he holds the universe together. Everything on my list that I enjoy to do, who do I have to thank for it? Jesus, the one who created all the animals, the one who put it together. Yes, Jesus. In the book of Colossians, we're told in chapter 1 that Jesus was the one through whom all things were created, the one who holds all things together. Everything that I've loved, I have Jesus to thank for. And God has given us all kinds of types, copies, symbols, shadows to help us better see Jesus so that we can see the perfect one, the one without blemish. Let, let me give you a, a few examples of, of some types. One is marriage. Marriage is a beautiful type, a copy, a symbol of our relationship with Jesus. The marriage analogy runs from Old Testament to New Testament. It's all over in there. It's all over in the Bible. And, and here's an example of the Apostle Paul using this analogy to help us understand Christ better. Ephesians 5, 20, uh, starting with verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church because we are members of his body for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh this mystery is great but i'm speaking with reference to christ and the church god gives us this beautiful picture this beautiful symbol of his relationship with us as we see the, the marriage between a husband and wife. But have you noticed anything with this type? Have you noticed that your spouse is not perfect? That you're not perfect? Marriage was meant to be a symbol. It was not meant for the way for, that you would become perfect. If you are looking for your spouse to be perfect without blemish, you're, you're going to be very disappointed. Now, I'm grateful that Mandy does not expect me to be perfect. I have a lot of blemishes. I've learned something very significant. If I have to be Mandy's source of perfection, we're in serious trouble. I'm so grateful at the beginning of the day that Mandy often leaves me up in the living room uh, reading my Bible while she goes downstairs to sit in the presence of Jesus, the perfect one. He meets needs in Mandy that I wouldn't have a chance of meeting. So she can come up from those moments with Jesus full of peace, full of joy, full of contentment. The best marriage advice that I can give you is get close to Jesus and do everything in your power to see that your spouse gets close to Jesus. And if anybody's considering leaving a marriage to go look for a perfect spouse, it's not the perfect spouse you need. It's Jesus you need. He is the perfect one. Another type, copy, symbol, shadow that God gives us is the government. Romans 13 verse 1. For every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Has anyone noticed that our government is not perfect? We have actually one of the most stable governments in human history. God has blessed us in this nation. But we do not have a perfect government. 
I'm not finding perfection in our president. I'm not finding perfection in the Republican Party. I'm not finding perfection in the Democratic Party. I'm not finding perfection in senators, representatives, judges, in our governors, in our mayors, even in our school boards, even in the CDC. I'm not finding perfection in any of those places. Yet my heart longs for perfection. I want to see things true and right and holy and honorable. Governments can only make us long for our king. They will never be able to take his place. I want to remind you of a, of a few things about our king in, in, in line with government. Even before he was born, even, but you know, yes, Jesus existed from all eternity past, but there was a moment in history where he took on human flesh and came and dwelt among us. But probably about six to seven hundred years before he even came, the, uh, the prophet Isaiah said this about him. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Yeah. Then Jesus shows up and Jesus tells his disciples, this is in Matthew 28, 18, he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus came as a man and, and won the battles that needed to be won. And he, God the Father, gives him all authority in heaven and on earth. And Jesus is a king. I pick up a conversation between him and Pilate in John 18, 37. Therefore, Pilate said to him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born. And for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus is a king. And the, the word that was given this, this morning at, at worship, talking about having your ticket, and, and on the... If we go to the very end of chapter 9... He talks about those who are eagerly looking for his return. Jesus, our king, is coming again. And in this heavenly scene, it's his government. It's his rule. It's his reign that is above all. Just listen to this. Revelation 19, starting with verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. And he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He has absolute authority, absolute reign. There is only one who is perfect. There is only one that is worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals. You won't find perfection in your family, in your job, in your possessions. I was thinking, have you noticed, like, when you get something new, and it's like perfect. You're so proud of it. You're so happy that you have this brand new something. 
And it's, it's just a matter of moments, it seems like, before you get a scratch on it or you get a ding in the car or uh, the new white shirt has the coffee stain that you just can't fully get out or the Dr. Pepper stain, Pastor Kevin. The, the new house that you're so excited about and it's, there's water leaking in the basement. It, 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 you don't find perfection in your possessions. And let me give you one more type that I, I just want to focus on for a moment this morning. This present life, this present life, the life that you're living right now, life is, is pretty cool. I think you have to agree. Life is so valuable. The fact that God created us and let us be a part of this, like, wow, we have so much to be thankful for. But doesn't it seem like something is missing? We can have a great family. We can have comfort. We can have money. We can have a good job. We can have good health. We can have fun hobbies. And still it seems as though something is missing. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote this. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. If that is so, I must take care, on the one hand, never to despise or be unthankful for these earthly blessings, and on the other, never to mistake them from the something else of which they are only a kind of copy or echo or mirage. I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find till after death. I must never let it get snowed under or turned aside. I must make it the main object of life to press on into to that other country and to help others to do the same. If you're familiar with C.S. Lewis, one of the things he talked about was the shadow lands. And often we have it completely backwards. We think this is it. This is life and this is all there is. And heaven is maybe just kind of a shadow of this life. Where C.S. Lewis is saying, no, 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 it's completely the opposite. Right now you're living in the shadow. The true life is coming. See, Randy Elkhorn uh, wrote a book called Heaven, and in it he, he writes this. Nothing is more often misdiagnosed than our homesickness for heaven. Read that again. Nothing is more often misdiagnosed than our homesick, homesickness for heaven. We think that what we want is sex, drugs, alcohol, a new job, a raise, a doctorate, a spouse, a large screen t television, a new car, a cabin in the woods, a condo in Hawaii. What we really want is the person we were made for, Jesus, and the place we were made for, heaven. Nothing less can satisfy us. If this present life was all there is, if this is as good as it gets, then why in the world would we care that Jesus made these statements? Jesus said this in John eleven twenty five. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Jesus says, I am the life. He says this in John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus identifies himself as life. 
I want to propose to you today on the authority of God's word as revealed in Hebrews chapter 9 that Jesus is greater than all types, all copies, all symbols, and all shadows. Jesus is the perfect one. You and I have a need for perfection. But we will not find perfection in anywhere but Christ. Your longings can be satisfied in Him alone. His perfect sacrifice made a way for you to enter into His kingdom. And kind of like the Lord's been challenging me over these last couple weeks. Can we try to do something maybe intentional where let's begin to think about Jesus a bit more. Let's begin to, to, to focus our attention on him. Let's, let's talk about him more. At the lunch break, at your supper table at home, talk about Jesus, the one who is perfect, the one who is good, the one who is greater than all types, all copies, all symbols, all shadows. Jesus invites us to come back to our first love. In Revelation 2, he writes to the church in Ephesus and he says this, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and that you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not. And you have found them to be false and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. So they've been doing a good job on a lot of upfronts. But then he says this in verse 4. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. Or else I am going, coming to you and re remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. I'm going to... Lucas, I'll, I'll just let you come and just kind of get ready for us closing here. Church, I, I think it's time for us to remember who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Everything else that we get focused on, everything else is, is, is but, a, but a copy, but a symbol, but a type, but, but a shadow. If you look in the pages of scripture, just, just a few of the titles, this, this isn't even a, a complete list, but just a few of the things that Jesus is. He's the advocate. Caleb, you can go ahead and pull that up. We'll see if we can read a few of those names on there. He's the advocate. He's the Lamb of God. He's the resurrection and the life. He's the good shepherd. He's the judge. He's the Lord of Lords, the man of sorrow. He's the head of the church. He's master, faithful and true witness. He's rock. He's high priest. He's the door. He's the giver of living water. He's the bread of life. He's the rose of Sharon. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the true vine. He's the Messiah, the teacher, the holy one, the mediator, the beloved, the branch, the light of the world. He's the image of the invisible God. He's the word, the chief cornerstone, the savior, suffering servant, author and finisher of our faith, the almighty, everlasting father. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the I am. He's the King of Kings, the Prince of Peace, the Bridegroom, the Only Begotten Son. He's Wonderful, Counselor, Emmanuel, Son of God, the Amen, the Prophet, the Redeemer, Anchor, Bright and Morning Star. He's the Way, the Truth, and the Life. He's Jesus Christ, the Perfect One. 
May we become so captivated with who Jesus is that we say like the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3, 8, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Please don't misunderstand this morning with the types that I talked about. I'm not saying don't cherish your spouse, don't, don't love the, the one that God has given you in marriage. I'm not saying don't value our government and pray earnestly for our officials. I'm not saying don't value this present life, but I am saying that Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater than all. And until you have a proper perspective of Jesus, you're not really going to see your spouse through the eyes that you could see them through. You're not really going to see the government through the, the eyes that you could see them through. You, you're not going to see life itself through the proper perspective without a clear view of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 9, a huge part of it is... Okay, Jesus is perfect, but then this perfect one is sacrificed for you and I. He willingly lays down his life. The perfect one dies for you and I, the imperfect ones, and makes a way so that we can be caught up into this incredible eternal story with him. He is good. He is really good, and he's worthy. As we close today, I, I've asked um, Lucas if, if he could close us in a song, Yeshua, my beloved. And I think some of us need to begin to see Jesus in a little bit different way than we've been looking at him. Some of us have this, this mental picture of him. You know, I, I see the long hair, I see the beard, I, I see Jesus 2,000 years ago. But this Jesus is alive and moving right now. And this Jesus is a lot bigger than who you think he is. And a lot of times we've been getting, even, even in the habit of, I say Jesus. I say just the Greek rendering of his name. And this song is saying Yeshua, the Hebrew rendering of his name. And the beginning part of this song references the Song of Solomon, where Bible scholars have, have, have looked at the, the, the Song of Solomon, and yes, at first reading, we see, wow, this is a passionate love song between a husband and wife. But many biblical scholars have said, you know what? This has to be in the canon. This has to be in the Bible. Because it's talking about, yes, it's talking about marriage, but then it's talking about something much, much deeper. It's talking about Jesus. And so this song is going to reference in the very beginning that my beloved is the most beautiful among thousands and thousands. Jesus is better. He's greater. And I'm going to let uh, Lucas just lead out in this. I'm going to give you a moment to just spend with Jesus. And then I just have a few closing comments that I want to make.
But the way I would like us to end is some of us maybe could just spend a few moments with Jesus before we leave and, and just ask the Holy Spirit to open our eyes again to who Jesus is. And just fall in love with the one who is perfect, the one who is blameless. Because sometimes we're looking every other place for perfection and you're not going to find it except in him. So some of you might want to just sit and just let this song just get in your heart and just begin to worship him. Some might want to come to the altar and, and just spend a few moments with him. And there might be some here this morning who you've never really surrendered your life to Jesus. It's time. It's time to surrender to Jesus. He is the king who is coming back. And our Hebrews chapter 9 ends with that call to those who are eagerly looking for his return. And some of you, when he comes back, you're, you're not ready. But this can be the day where you surrender your life to him and you say, Jesus, come and take your rightful place. Jesus, you're the one that I've been looking for my entire life, even though maybe I didn't even realize it. Jesus, you're the perfect one. You're the one that I need. And he has been waiting for you to pray that prayer and give him an invitation. This could be your day. So if you need to go, you're free to go. If you, have, if you can sit in his presence or come and spend some moments with him, or if you want to have a conversation with Jesus and surrender your life to him this morning, please do.